everyone. We're an Albuquerque based company, uh, but we have staff kind of all over at this point. We've become a lot more remote in the past year. Um, we're six years old. Uh, we have about 65 employees or 100, depending on who you're talking to at RS21 at any given moment, but it's closer to about 70. We're growing really, really, really fast. And we're, we're picking up a lot of really great awards. Um, we've gotten some press recently for being in Inc.'s 500 fastest growing companies. We're traditionally always recognized as one of Albuquerque business first best places to work. And we got a really great feather in our cap this year with our um, best place for innovator workplaces from Fast Company. Um, and so, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is this, this talk is about my experience at a truly exceptional company. Um, we're an outlier. And a lot of the things that I think that we've been able to kind of play around with and experiment with here, RS21 really has to do with the fact that we are a pretty progressive, pretty young, pretty open-minded, pretty quick to move organization. And so I do just want to recognize that some of the things I say, you might be sitting there thinking, well, that's nice for you, but I can't do that in my organization. And I understand that we all work in different places in different contexts. But hopefully um, some of the things that I talk about today will be applicable no matter what environment you're in. Um, so a little bit more about RS21 to give some context about what we do. Um, we're really a company that's focused on helping any organization that likes to make better decisions with data, make those better decisions. And we like to focus as much as we possibly can on organizations, nonprofits, government agencies, businesses that really are trying to focus on making the world a better place. So do good with data is on the sign behind me. And that's that's really kind of what, what we exist for. And our solutions, be it a digital interface or really cool data science um, uh, piece of, of discovery and thought leadership, or even just a presentation we have on anything that we're doing, really we're trying to make sure that it's insightful it's giving new information. It's intuitive that and people who are using it like to use it. It's inspiring. People are excited to use it and it's intellectually honest. So it doesn't have a bunch of spin on it or tell some sort of story that just isn't true. Um, we work in a lot of different domains. Uh, the, the big four that I think we usually focus on are around um, healthcare, state and local government, federal government, and then we do a lot of really exciting work in R&D, specifically partnering with national labs. But you can see the domains that we work on are kind of all over the place. So the other thing that I think, you know, in addition to us being a company who has a mission about doing good with data and working across all sorts of different domains and, and things that truly do make the world a better place, we're what we like to call ourselves a values-based organization. And so what does that mean to be a values-based organization? Well, these are nine tenants that we use to pretty much guide everything we do. Um, it's in our hiring process. It's in our annual review process. Um, these come up when we give each other shout outs at our, at our every other week staff meeting. These kind of guide our decisions about, you know, what clients are we going to work with or what work maybe isn't a great fit for us. Um, and, and they even touch things like, I've noticed in conflict management, if I run up against a problem, chances are it's because either someone's not living the values or we're defining the values in a different way and we need to come to agreement on what those are. And so I say this because a lot of the talk that I'm gonna give is, is really about, I don't think it would be possible if I didn't work at a missions-based organization that had a clear set of values. Um, more importantly than our work, more importantly than our values really is um, our team. And this is a picture of some of us, not all of us, in the before times when we were allowed to be close to each other without masks on. And I don't think we appreciated what we were doing at the moment, but looking at this picture, I'm like, oh man, we used to have a lot of fun, like totally tons, like dogs in the office and people screaming. And it was, it was a great place to work. And then COVID hit. And the pandemic, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on this. This has been hard for everybody. We've all experienced the, the pandemic, the, the emotional, the financial, the logistical tolls differently. It's real. And the way that I talk about it, um, when I'm having one-on-ones with my team or talking with my friends who are just over it, it's just, we're all cosmically tired on a cellular level. We are exhausted. And so I don't, I don't want to get up here and say that COVID hasn't impacted our business. It, it has. Um, we've had to change the way that, that we exist and the way that we engage with one another in the world. Um, but, you know, the good news is, is that 
it hasn't been all that bad. So this is a picture of us now. Um, this is a lot of our team, not all of us. And so what's going on here? Well, I will guarantee you that this is Photoshopped. Um, our marketing director took a lot of different pictures and made sure that she got everybody's good angle. And I think Natalie's on here. Thank you, Natalie, for doing that. Um, so, we, But we're all typically doing pretty well. Um, so so how, how are we doing well and not looking like completely exhausted people on, on this Zoom call photo? Um, a lot of things happened at the beginning of 2020 that were not cool. RS21 had some hard bumps that we went through and the beginning of 20, at the beginning of 2020, we said, okay, we need to step back and we need to really start thinking about how we're living our values. And we really need to make a commitment, not just to our work and to excellence and to, you know, profitability, which obviously we need to be committed to as a business, but we need to become committed to our people and to the culture and to the environment that we have here. And so a long story short, um, even with some of the roadblocks at the beginning of 2020, even when COVID hit us all hard and our entire way of life changed, 2020 was the best year RS21 has ever had, period. Financially, strategically, employee satisfaction, growth, client base, work quality, the awards that we're winning, 2020 was our highest performing year as an organization to the point where I think we kind of like, we're all a little like, what did, did, did somebody like, is just Charles in a pack with the devil, our CEO, like what's going on here? How did we do so, so well? And I, when I was putting together this talk two weeks ago, um, I said, I just started writing down things of like, what are we doing? Well, what's going well? And I realized it wasn't really magic. It wasn't a genie. Charles is not, in fact, in the pack with the devil, but um, we're actually living our values in terms of how we handle our teams and how we treat the people at RS21. And so the talk was going to be a little bit of everything from all nine of our values in order to be respectful of everybody's time and try to get done by six. I'm keeping it to, to six things that we are doing from our values and some sub points about how we as leaders, as a leadership team, as even just like um, people who are leading projects or uh, peer leaders in groups, really everyone's doing this. It's not just like C-suite and leadership, but at, at RS21, being humble, evolving and learning, disrupt, sustain the movement, evoking childlike wonder, Josh, that goes out to you, and loving humanity are, are the important things that we are really doing that I think are leading to the fact that we have help, happy, healthy, high-performing teams. And I wanted to share that with you um, and kind of just start a conversation about this. Is this, does this ring true with you? Would this actually help you? Um, is it insane and it would never happen? So I'll start with be humble. Did, before, we, before we jump into it, any questions about RS21 or our team or our business or anything like that? Nope, just a lot of great comments and uh, about working there and you, know, being, you guys being in New Mexico. Awesome. So be humble is the first one um, that I always like to think. And, and this is really for anyone who you know, has the opportunity and the responsibility to set the emotional tone for the team. Um, I, I like this slide a lot. And when I start to talk about my management philosophy, I talk a lot about servant leadership. And the idea of servant leadership, if that's something new to you, is the more seniority you have, the more responsibility you have to serve those on your team. And the more you put other people in front of you, um, you're really there to protect and serve your team and to basically manage up so they don't understand or have to deal with some of the yuck stuff that's going on around them. You're creating a safe space for your team to be able to really be excellent at the things that they're being tasked to do. Um, some, some of those things, like what do they look like? Um, sharing credit and taking blame, right? If, if something bad happens on your team, you're like, ah, oh, bummer, I didn't set clear enough expectations or I didn't support you when I needed to or dang, I put way too much on your plate. Another very easy way to start to build some servant leadership stuff into your relationships with your team if you're not living this kind of, 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 of relationship is really just to ask some questions. What can I do to help you with that? What do you need from me? How can I help you this week? Is there anything I need to be aware of that will make your life easier? These are some questions that I ask regularly in my one-on-ones. And I think that by being there for my team, um, I start to build that sense of trust and respect that's mutual from, with everybody at my company. 
The second thing uh, in terms of being a humble leader is really that emotional self-awareness. Um, as a leader, even just as a, as a human in the world, you're responsible for knowing your feelings and understanding how you show up with them in your professional environment. Um, the challenge, and it's, it, it can be very challenging right now, is to bring your best self to work. And when I say your best self, I don't necessarily mean 100%, especially right now, that's hard. I mean the best self you can possibly bring to work. Um, and if that best self is 60% of your best self, still bring that 60% with you. Um, and so what I have up here is a, a tool I got in therapy. Uh, my therapist told me I need to be more aware of articulating my feelings. And so I find this feelings will really helpful if I'm having, you know, usually I'm like, I'm happy or I'm angry. And as I realize there are other feelings besides happy and angry, if I'm at work and I realize like I'm cranky or I have a short fuse or I have a headache, I can stop and think you know, what, what is the feeling I'm having? How am I bringing that into my professional environment? And very specifically, is that how I want to be bringing that into my professional environment? Um, Jill, the person I introdu introduced at the beginning of the call, will have some one-on-ones where I'll be like, how you doing? And she's like, I'm angry. And, or I'll be like, I'm angry. And we sit there and we go, okay, vibe check. Right. And it, it just simply like, how are you? Is this how you want to feel? And is this how you want to bring yourself into your team? And so this is this is very, very helpful. And it sounds silly, maybe, but I think it's really, really, really helpful to do that yourself and, and to help other people feel empowered to have feelings at work. Um, one of the articles I have in the resources section is um, called We Need to Talk About Crying at Work. And it's it's written by a man. And the entire thing is, is that, hey, guess what? You're allowed to be a whole person and you're allowed to have not pleasant feelings at work. And you're probably even allowed to express them if you're doing it in a professional and thoughtful way that's not destructive or inappropriate. Um, so, you know, we've talked about servant leadership, emotional self-awareness, and then the, the next thing that you can really do is be an empathetic person. Um, empathy is so important in terms of understanding that you don't understand a whole lot about what's going on with those people around you on your team, uh, your colleagues, your peers. Um, when I first started being in a leadership position, I called my brother and I was like, yo, I have no idea what to do. I don't know how to lead people. I don't know anything. And he gave me one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received. And he said, you know, you need to view every single person that you're working with as an individual. They're not you. They're not your peers. They're not who you want them to be. They're not the CEO. They are them and you have to meet them where they are and you have to respect that they're going through things that you will never go through. Um, and so just really listening to your team uh, and realizing that sometimes issues don't need solutions and that it's not necessarily your responsibility to solve all the problems, but just say like, I'm, I'm taking some time to understand what this person might be going through. Small things that I do to try to make sure that that happens with everybody um, on my team is really just knowing little things about my staff that they offer up. Um, what are their pets names? What are their hobbies? What are they super stressed out about at work or not at work? And again, this will vary by culture, right? In some, in some work environments, it's just not appropriate to know things about your staff outside of work. So I'm not saying dig, I'm not saying be nosy or be weird, but whatever is offered up, realize that that's a gift that that person is sharing with you and trusting you with. Um, so empathy is one thing, but another thing that I think is even more important is validation. Um, validation, and I heard this sometime last week on something I was listening to, but validation can be seen as empathy demonstrated. So I understand you and I'm gonna demonstrate that I understand you. Um, a really simple way to do that is just to do affirmative statements. That's valid, or you're not imagining that, or wow, that's kind of nuts. Um, you know, we just, how many of you had to work during the insurrection, right? And so me just reaching out to my team and being like, hi, this is strange. Maybe if you're not working today, that's okay. <laughs> um, maybe go watch the news. Or on the other hand, because of empathy and realizing that everybody's the same, if you need to drown yourself in work and you don't want to talk about that, that's cool too. Just keep on doing your thing. But to, to, to just affirm that something is happening, it's like the opposite of gaslighting, right? Validation is so important. Um, another part of this that I think is important, um, and I actually learned from um, 
Some of you might know Erin, who used to work at RS21. She, now she works at Trek Bikes. But she she was talking with me, um, and so was Jill and a couple other folks about the concept of toxic positivity. Like, where where is the line between let's be cheerful and let's keep on a good face? And I'm actually not. I'm invalidating you by asking you to be happy or to tell you everything's going to be fine when you know what? Maybe it won't. And so I, I really liked this this image right here, talking about like, yeah, hey, like I see you're really stressed. This is really hard. Um, and, and this helps me develop relationships with people um, at all levels of the organization here. Another thing that's important in terms of validation is to acknowledge that just because you're not experiencing it doesn't mean it's not happening. And so you might have heard about terms like microaggressions or code switching or gender bias. If, if you don't experience those things, that's great. I'm glad you don't. But somebody on your team may be and just because you're not doesn't mean that, that that they aren't. So being not invalidating people when they share that with you is important. Um, what I haven't seen that isn't necessarily the right way to, to end the conversation with somebody who's trying to be open with you. And so the last, the last thing I'll talk about right now is this concept of vulnerability. And this is a, a big trend in you know, self-help and organizational uh, psychology, but really, you know, the idea of, of coming to work and coming to your professional relationships as your whole person, as your whole self, where you can speak your truth, you can be your whole weird, nuanced self. Um, that's, that's a way to also build that mutual respect and trust with people on your team. Um, it's okay not to know, right? It's okay to say, I have no idea, but I can, I can figure it out or I know who can help me figure it out. It's okay to say, man, I really messed that up and I'm sorry in the future. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take more ownership of that or man, I, I don't think I did a very good job. Can you tell me like how I can do better at that? And being vulnerable, being human, being open is, is, is really helpful in terms of having that tone of being humble and setting that tone and expectation with your team. Um, I will kind of have a caveat here. There is a fine line between being open and being creepy and oversharing. Um, so know your room and know your culture and know your industry and know what's appropriate. Um, some conversations you just don't need to have with people you work with. And, and that was that's a lesson that I think I'm constantly learning. I can be an overshare. And so just thinking about like, this is the time or place for this, um, it can be very helpful. So in terms of being a humble leader and that leading to you know happy, healthy, high-performing teams, these are just some questions I'd encourage you to think through. Um, what kind of leader are you? What kind of leader do you want to be? Um, how do you know and manage what vibes you're bringing to your team? How do you validate your team? And is there one thing you could do to be more humble or more vulnerable as a leader? And I don't necessarily, like I said, I'll, um, this is being recorded and the deck will go out. So you don't need to scribble these down because the deck will be sent to you when we're done. Um, I'm gonna pause because this was, and I promise you the longest section of the six. Um, any questions or comments for me before I launch into the other ones? I'm also gonna take a drink, drink of water. Anybody wants to jump in, they're welcome to. I think it's fantastic. I mean, you know, this is great advice, not just for coworkers and your team and, um, you know, your peers, but just, I think, good general life advice, right? Like fantastic information. Oh, yeah. This is, and I should say, none of these are my ideas, right? These are all things that I have learned over my, my I've had amazing um, mentors. I've had amazing bosses. I've had amazing people that I work with. I've had amazing people that work on my team. And so this is all stuff I've gathered from those relationships, a lot of therapy, scrolling Instagram, like this is coming from all over the place. So please don't think that I'm inventing this stuff. No, it's great. It's great to put it in the context of how it can support us in our workplace and make us successful. So thank you so much. Sure, sure. And uh, again, happy to answer any questions at any point. So the second thing that I think is really important is this concept of evolving and learning, um, engaging and challenging your team, right? I know that can sound like a crazy thing to do when we're all under duress from a pandemic or times of transition or times of stress or, or change at your, at your organization, but really uh, making sure your team is engaged and challenged is, is really, really important. The first step to that, I think, is having a great team, um, hiring people who are different than you who are smarter than you, who are more talented than you, who have uh, strengths and weaknesses that are different than yours. Um, hiring people who you know will outshine you. It's very important. 
um, hiring people that you know that you will learn from, that other people will learn from, um, and that they'll also have an opportunity to learn uh, from, from your organization and everybody else on your team. A huge part of that, I think, is um, a, a, a firm organizational commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's something really new for us at RS21. Um, we talked about it for a long time. And finally this year at, at our, at our um, leadership offsite, we said, hey, we should make like an actual goal for this. Um, and, and part of that was in 2020, we spun up um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion team that has a couple of leadership members and majority of staff from different walks of life to talk about these hard issues. Like, what does diversity mean? What, what does it look like for us at RS21? How are we being inclusive? What does true inclusive mean? And, and equity, like, are we an equitable company? And so we're having some, I think, very challenging and, and interesting conversations. I'm not part of this group. I think there's a couple of people on this call who are, who might be able to answer questions about it. Um, but essentially, like even just having these conversations and saying this is something that we know we need to happen is part of having um, a challenged and engaged uh, group of folks. Um, the second thing that I think is really important in terms of uh, challenging your team and engaging them is providing meaningful work. Um, consistently looking to say, am I giving you amazing work that lights up your eyes, that helps you grow towards the goals that you set for yourself? Um, and this image I've always really liked, um, I think I'm going to butcher it, but I think it, you say ikigai. And the, the thought here is, you know, there's an intersection of what you're great at, what you love to do, what people actually need that has value and what you can get paid to do. And if you can find that intersection there, like you're winning at life. And, and I think a lot of times people at RS21, I don't know if they come in thinking like, oh, here I go. I'm going to find myself right in the center of this amazing Venn diagram. But I think a lot of people who have been here for a long time, um, for a tech company to be any place longer than like two years is kind of a long time. So anyone who's been here for three years, it's kind of like, yeah, no, I'm feeling this. This this work is meaningful. Um, I'm getting paid well. Uh, you know, I, I'm good at this and there's actually a market for it, believe it or not. And so is that going to be possible in every project, in every organization across time? Absolutely not. And so the way I kind of set my team's expectations with that is I say, I really like you to have one thing that you're working on that you're enjoying. And maybe you're enjoying it just because you're having a good time with the people you're working with. And I'd like you to have one thing that's up in the horizon that you're looking forward to getting to when it comes there. So there's a little bit of, I like my everyday, I'm present in the moment and a little bit of like something on the horizon is keeping me like, I've got something to, to, to work for. So there is that kind of, um, meaningful work in terms of uh, uh, the emotional benefit of that. But then I'll also kind of say another big thing that RS21 did this past year in 2020 that I think is phenomenal is incentivizing people financially for working towards these shared goals. Um, in 2020, our, our C-suite leadership was able to open up stock options to 100% of people that work at RS21. And so um, we're not a 100% employee owned company, but 100% of employees have an option to own part of the company. And that was really exciting. Um, it was like the one time I cried at work is when that was announced because I was like, I'm so proud of this company. This is so amazing because it's everybody at every level. Um, and I think that's pretty rare. So that made me feel really good about working here. And I, I, I think it has made uh, other people feel pretty good about being included in, in that we're working towards a shared goal. Um, you know, this thing might, this slide might actually be the most controversial thing I'll say in this entire talk. Um, I believe in strengths-based management and strengths-based management is this somewhat radical idea that everyone has strengths and weaknesses and you're going to get happier, higher producing, healthier people if you focus on the things that they do better and you amplify the things that they're innately better at. Because what that does is that validates their um, innate and inherent worth as a human being. It puts them in places where they can be successful, spends less time talking about negative things that they need to improve. And it, it really leverages intrinsic motivation in a team to say like, you're badass at that. So go do all of that. Do all of that all the time because you're really good at that. That thing you're bad at, just be honest about it. You're bad at that. And you, you don't need to be good at it. Find something, find somebody else who can support you because I guarantee you, 
there's going to be somebody else who's really good at that and they'll, they'll love to do it. Um, a good example of that is um, I love organizing things. Uh, my friends will call me when they have to move because I want to go to their house and I want to organize their clothes and throw them away. And, and some of my friends are like, you're insane. And I'm like, no, that's one of my strengths. One of my strengths is organizing. Please let me throw away all your clothes. Um, so, you know, one thing that you think is, is the most odious task in the world, somebody else is going to really enjoy doing it. So again, I would just challenge you. I do see this as a huge part of um, diversity, equity, inclusion. I see this as a hu huge part of inclusion. You can look at somebody and say, well, your strengths may not be this thing that I want you to fit in, but if I do leverage your strengths, maybe I'll have something even cooler than I thought because, wow, you're so talented at that. And I didn't even know I need that talent until we started to really build that together. Um, and the last thing I'll say about Evolve and Learn is that it's really important to invest in your people's growth. Um, it's not just like, hi, there is a person-shaped hole at the company and you're going to do this task forever. It's like, I'm bringing you on because I want what you can do, but I also want you to grow here. I want you to learn and I want you to be excited and I want you to bring new things to the table. I kind of always joke um, when I'm talking to new people who are entering the field of user experience design, I'm like, listen, Apply for jobs that you can do 50% of and promise that you'll learn the other 50%. Because why would I want someone who can do 100% of the job? There's nothing for them to grow into and be challenged and be engaged. And that expectation of lifelong learning and, and challenging yourself and continuing to like think through things I think is really important. Um, so offering professional development time, personal development time, um, individually, like, hey, you've got some self-selected time where you can go take a class you want or uh, you know, we're gonna do this group training where everybody has to come to it, but I promise it's gonna be fun. Um, on and off the clock, I think, I think is really, really important in terms of having your teams be engaged and invested. So we're at the end of section two. Uh, so I'll just leave you with some of these questions. Um, who do you hire? Why do you hire them? Uh, do you and your team derive meaning and joy from the work you do? Could you, if you don't? And if, if the answer is no, you probably should find a new job. Um, what goals are you working towards together? Were they co-created or were they imposed top down? Um, would strengths-based management be something that would actually work for your organization? Um, you know, why or why not? And do you invest in your team? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause mostly to drink water, but questions, comments, dissent? Okay. Lots gonna... of great comments. Tons of great comments. Um, third thing, uh, disrupt is one of our values at RS21. And disrupt, I think when we first started talking about this, when we were creating our organizational values was more disrupting in the market. How can we bring new ideas? How can we be innovative? But really what I think it kind of comes to is also being empowered and disrupting the status quo, not just in the market, but also in the day-to-day. Uh, part of work. So, you know, really the, the thought here of, um, you know, architecting your own solution, uh, the best ideas are coming from staff. Um, if you, if, if, if there's a problem at your organization, it's fine to offer up suggestions, but it's even better to make sure that you're getting other people involved and helping co-create solutions to the problem together. Um, I We had some uh, management coaching or something like that last two years ago. And one of the things that I really liked from the session that we had was this concept of, are you the person that's always going in and fixing the problems? Okay, great. Well, you probably think that you're awesome and that you're really smart and that you're super helpful and everybody loves you. But did you ever stop to think that you're taking away that other person's ability to solve that problem for themselves? And to also get that hit of, of like endorphin rush that you get when you successfully solve a problem. And I didn't really realize that I was being like a joy thief by solving problems for people. And I was like, oh, wow, I actually want to empower people around me to be like, well, I trust that you can figure it out. If you can't, let me know and I'll help problem solve with you. But I want, I want you to feel ownership over that. I want you to come up with a solution. Um, and I think that gives everybody on my team or, or in the company kind of a sense of ownership and longevity. Like, I wanna see this come to light. I wanna see this problem get solved. I wanna see my idea be the one 
that, that improves my life. I want to feel like I have agency in the culture and in the processes of this place. Um, and so that leads me to the story of our employee well-being group. And it's an awesome story. So in 2019, Jill uh, Morgan, our senior UX designer on the call with us was, um, we were in, in her, her annual review. And at the end of my annual reviews with my team, I say, I wanna hear feedback from you because I'm giving you a bunch of feedback about stuff, positive things to improve, blah, blah, blah. I wanna hear from you what we could be doing better, what I could be doing better as your manager, what RS21 could be doing better um, as a company. And Jill said, you know, hey, you know, I don't, I don't want to be Debbie Downer. I'm enjoying our, our, um, our, 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 our annual review, but there's just a couple of things that are swing on that are really upsetting me. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, let's, let's talk about it. I wanted to hear, I wanted to understand what was going on. And so Jill was like, okay, well, A and B and C and 27 and 48 and, and there was this long list of things that Jill was like, this is not working for me. And I, I sat there and I was like, all right. And I was like, well, what, you know, what do you think? And, and Jill started explaining to me, um, she used to work at REI in Seattle. And she said, well, here's what we do at REI. And so Jill was explaining some ways that REI was collecting staff feedback, um, assessing that feedback regularly, and then making changes in their process and the way they do day-to-day -day stuff. And I said to Jill, I was like, well, do you think we could do that here? And she's like, I don't know. And I was like, okay, I think you should do it. And that's how the EWB was formed essentially. Um, I, I said, hey, Jill, I think this is a great idea. I think you should write up a plan uh, explaining what the issue is, explaining what you think it should do, talk with C-suite, get some executive sponsorship. And essentially um, what we do now is there's a quarterly survey that goes out to all staff, it's anonymous. And there's just a handful of questions. Um, what's going well? Uh, what's not working, how could we solve that, anything else we need to know. Um, and what the employee well-being group does there, it's, a, it's a, a group of staff, so they're not leadership, they're not HR or anything like that. It's a group of employees. They spend an absolute ton of time and energy and effort going through the survey results pulling out the things that are actually not just outliers, like one person's upset about this thing, but saying like, what are the trends? And then the employee well-being group takes the, the findings and recommendations and goes to C-suite and said, this is what we think you should do. And the thing that I've been really pleased with at RS21 is, um, you know, we've gotten some rough news from these surveys. We've gotten some hard, hard feedback. And I'd say overall, I'd say probably about and Jill can correct me on this, I'd say like 75 to 80% of the things that the employee well-being group has recommended have happened. Jill, can you yes or no me on that? Yes. And if they have not already happened, they are in progress on the back end. We actually had our um, EWB employee well-being planning session today. And so many of the things that you're talking about right now, right now just came up. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out here that I would never have felt comfortable bringing two pages of, you know, solution-based problems to Jess um, had I not had that psychological safety and had we not um, established that kind of relationship really early in my time there. Our relationship as um, mentee, mentor, or boss and individual contributor is really based on being completely honest. And I, I feel like I can do that with her because we've built that. I also felt like I could bring things to Cameron, Cam, who's on the call now, and Charles, because I felt the same way with them. And um, while this worked for me, maybe it doesn't work for your company, but I think there are ways to work this into it. Back to you, Jess. Thanks, Jill. Um, so, you know, the employee well-being group, again, I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the uh, of the conversation here that 2020 was our best year. And there is no way that that would have happened without our employee well-being group and without the commitment from our leadership team to actually listen and invest in some of the changes that needed to ha happen. And you can see from the data, um, people are more satisfied with RS21 as an employer, they're more satisfied in their role, and more people would recommend working here to a friend. And so that to me was like, 
you know, yes, there's an investment in the time of our people. Yes, it, it, it was challenging and we've had some scary conversations. And no, I don't always agree with everything Employee Wellbeing Group asks for personally, but that's not the point. The point is, is that we're having these conversations and we're creating an environment which our staff is, is encouraged to speak up, speak their mind, disrupt, make things happen, be the architect of their own solution. And so Jill kind of uh, mentioned this, um, the concept of psychological safety. So we said, well, what, you know, why could, why could, you know, I do this here at RS21, but I couldn't do it at my last job? Well, because I didn't feel psychologically safe. I felt like, you know, anytime I'd say something, I'd get in trouble or I'd be told like, hey, you're not supposed to say that. Or people would not even listen to what I was saying, or, you know, I'd have to present a version of myself that I wasn't, I wasn't psychologically safe necessarily in my last job. And I wasn't able to be a vulnerable leader in the way that I am at RS21. And so thinking about psychological safety, um, Adam Grant is this um, organizational psychologist, and he does a lot of, um, he's got a new book out uh, about some of these things. And so I, I am not an expert on psychological safety. I don't think we do it 100% great at RS21. I think that's something that we know as leaders, like we kind of have to work on, but it's something that we're aware of. And it's something that we think about how do we create this kind of environment. And then, you know, the last thing that's kind of the, been the thread throughout this entire section of disrupt is this concept of encouraging agency and ownership. Um, any of you who have gone to therapy have heard hurt people hurt people, but I also think there's a positive spin to that, right? Empowered people empower people truly. And so if you're telling your staff, hey, you can figure this out, you're smart. I totally trust you in this meeting. I totally trust you to make this decision. If you give these, you know, if you give people on your team the sense that they have agency and that they can actually make change, you're gonna really per create that kind of psychological safety and allow better ideas to bubble up to the top. Um, so in terms of disrupt, the, the kinds of questions I, I might ask you is, do you regularly step back and let people co-create solutions? Are your employees happy and healthy? How do you know? How is failure and experimentation viewed at your organization? How do you empower your team? And what's thing, one thing that you could do to empower your team or increase psychological safety even more? Any comments, questions? Nope, okay. Number four, uh, one of our values is about sustain the movement. And again, I think when we started this value, a lot of it was about finances, right? Like, do we have the money to keep going? Are we a profitable business? Um, but as we started having conversations on the leadership level, it really became clear that this was about um, sustaining the health and happiness of our staff, um, getting through hard projects, getting through hard transitions, um, bringing your best self to work. And so I think this one is especially relevant during COVID, um, during some of these things that are going on and realizing, I mean, I think we all thought this was going to be like two months and I'm going back to the office. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. And so just recognizing that sustaining people's energy, sustaining sense of, um, you know, health and happiness is really, really hard during uh, what's going on in the pandemic. The first thing that I think that you can do to help your staff and to frankly help yourself um, at work is to really teach and model professional boundary setting. And I really like this Instagram slide about boundaries at work. Um, and they're gonna be different for everybody. They're gonna be different for every situation. They're gonna be different for every employer. Um, and you know, I think sometimes boundaries get a bad rap because it sounds a lot like saying no. Like, no, I'm not doing that. No, that's not my responsibility. And that is absolutely not what boundaries are. Um, boundaries are really understanding your limits and being able to respectfully communicate them to other people. It's listening carefully to understand others' limits and respecting them. And the thing that I have been working on at RS21 is this concept of um, finding a path to yes. So my boundary isn't to just say, no, I'm not doing that. It's to step back and say, okay, I can do that thing. But here's the things that I need to have happen around me in order for that to be a healthy choice or a sustainable choice or to allow me to make uh, you know, good work happen for this task to happen. A really common, um, and anybody from RS21 on the call is gonna laugh about this, is business development. 
business development comes in hot and fast at RS21. Quick fill out this proposal. I need an estimate, do this thing. Can you have it done by the end of the day? And often my response is like, are you insane? No, I can have it Friday. And that's me setting a boundary. But a path yes would say, okay, do you really need this by the end of the day? Can you help me understand why? Okay, so you definitely need this by the end of the day. So my boundary can be, um, you know, I have something important in my personal life that I have to do at five. So one of my boundaries is I have to do it in, in the, the day today. I'm not doing it tonight. And then another boundary can be, I'm also gonna to have to move this other thing to tomorrow. Can you help me move that other thing to tomorrow? So boundaries are, you know, it's not just saying no, it's finding a path to yes in a way that's healthy and is a win-win hopefully for everybody. And sometimes you just have to say like, listen, I'm really sorry, I cannot get to this until tomorrow morning, but I'll have it to you by noon. And hopefully that's gonna work. Um, and being a team player is, is, you know, boundaries are not at odds with being a, a team player because they let you be accountable and they let you be uh, reliable and they let you sometimes under promise and overperform. So, you know, these, these are important things to start to, to bring into your life if you don't already. Um, really simple things I do to encourage my team and everybody else at RS21, frankly, is just to do little time management things like blocking out your calendar where you say, no, I'm not taking meetings. And if you dare try to schedule one, I will decline it. Um, please ask me if you're going to schedule over this time. Or, hey, uh, I already saw that like three other people from the design team are on this meeting. Do I really need to be there? Does that person really need to be there? Can these two people, like, since we're doing trust and 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 you know trust and responsibility, and and like we could, this person can do it? Do I need to be there? Probably not. And so I think just deciding, um, you know, what your boundaries need to be, and uh, being pleasant about enforcing them, and re really also respecting other people's. Um, I had somebody recently enforce some boundaries with me at work, and I was like, what? And I was like, no, 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 this is good. Okay, awesome. It's inconvenient for me, but I need to respect them. Um, this, this slide cracks me up. Um, this is from one of my favorite people in the world. Um, she's basically my sister-in-law, Marty. She gave this fantastic talk at a UX conference a couple of years ago about um, avoiding burnout. And uh, really one of the things that she talked about was this thought about, you know, what can you actually fix from your giant set of problems? What are your actual problems? What are the ones that you can control? And like being really smart about, guess what? I can't do anything about that. So I'm not going to have feelings about that. Um, for the ones that you can control, what are the ones that you can, that you can change that'll actually increase your happiness? And then of those, what are the ones I'm actually going to focus my time and energy on? Because if you're trying to address all of your problems, the ones you don't really care about, the ones that you can't control, good luck. Now is not the time to be doing that. And so really kind of narrowing it down to, to the bottom of this funnel, I think is a really, really good way to think about um, what shit should you give. I think this also ties in, if we have any philosophers in here, this is a shout out to Josh Rivera. Thank you, Josh. Josh gave me a book um, on daily stoic meditations. And I think that uh, you know uh, stoic meditations kind of tie into this, right? Like how, how can I be present? How can I control the things I can control? And how can I let go of the other things? Jill and I were talking the other day too about the concept of detachment. I care about this, it's important to me, but I am going to lovingly detach from this. And the, the, the statement that I use around that is I'm not available to take that on right now. It's not that I can't, it's not that I don't want to, it's, it's not that um, I don't understand that it's important, but I'm just not available to take that on right now. Does that mean that you should come bother me about it tomorrow? No, because I know that it's on there and I'll let you know if suddenly I become available to take that on but setting that kind of like, I am detaching myself from this. And sometimes it's not even saying it to somebody else. Sometimes it's saying it to yourself. Are you taking that on because somebody asked you to do it or are you just getting out there trying to solve problems? So think about what you are detaching from and what you are attaching to. Um, this slide I thought, you know, is just, we are all overwhelmed right now. And again, if you go through that thought of, you know, what can I, what can I actually change? You're gonna know what are those things that you can delegate to other people. And especially as leaders, I've seen um, people have a hard time with this. Like, I need to own this. This is, this is my little thing. I started it and I'm gonna finish it forever. Or there's no possible way you could do it correctly. But trusting and delegating to your team and to others um, and really trusting that people will catch you 
and, and not let you fall is, is pretty important. And I think that if you've done the other things that we've talked about, if you are a humble leader, um, if you're encouraging your staff to evolve and learn, if you're allowing people to be disruptive, you taking something off your plate can actually be a gift to somebody else. Now, I'm not saying like, take all the crap work and be like, oh, this is the worst task ever. In fact, like as a servant leader, I feel like if the task is that horrible, you probably should do it yourself. But if there's something that you can do to stretch somebody else or to make them feel like they're learning in ways that are important, please, please delegate and please have faith that the people will be there for you and that the, the work will get done. Maybe it won't get done the way that you were going to do it. Maybe it won't get done, you know, to the specifications that you want and you can go in and kind of coach that, but maybe it'll get done better than you thought it was going to get done. Or maybe it get done in a different way that you didn't even know existed and suddenly change your entire process. Um, so definitely encourage you to delegate. And this is uh, the, the last slide in the sustain the movement section. And really this, this is about advocating for healthy policies and practicing self-care. So if you're in a position of leadership or any influence at your organization, you can advocate for healthy policies. You can talk about, we need to add mental health days to our sick days. We need an employee assistance program. We need flex time. Um, back to the empathy thought, everyone is going through something different. Um, if you've got somebody right now who's handling elder care or has a parent in hospice that they can't see, if you've got somebody who just adopted a new baby and is learning how to be a parent for the first time, if you have somebody who has a child at home who has COVID, um, you have no idea what someone's going through, but really now is the time to explore and advocate for alternate setups. Can someone go part-time? Can you have a flexible work schedule where that was not possible before? Can we go remote or stay remote as some of us start to move back into the office? Can you encourage your team to block off your calendars or have like no meeting Mondays or whatever needs to happen? This is the time to be thoughtful about healthy policies. And then self-care, I, you know, this, you, you cannot, help and lead and be there and show up as your best self if you are not taking your care of yourself. And you cannot ask your staff to do that if you're not doing it yourself. So please take your vacation, turn off Slack. I promise you the messages will be there on Tuesday when you come back. Take time out in the middle of the day to go to that doctor's or therapist's appointment and don't feel bad about it because that's self-care and that's what you need to do. Um, so, you know, sustaining the movement, self-care, those are all incredibly important things always but especially right now. Um, and that was one thing I was going to say too. This is a pretty similar to talk to what I would have given before COVID because it's just stuff that makes happy, healthy, high-performing employees. So my questions for you around sustain the movement would be like, what are your professional boundaries? Have you taken the time to set them? What are your staff's professional boundaries? Do you respect them? What's one thing you can control that would increase your own happiness? Could you delegate free things to someone else? Do you model and encourage self-care? And are there any he healthy policies that you'd like to advocate for at your organization? Questions, comments? Okay, we're nearing the home stretch. Evoke childlike wonder is one of our um, one of our values at RS21. And usually it has to do with creating, and, and this is fun for me because I'm the director of design. It has to do with creating like really beautiful, really fun interfaces and just having a lot of joy in the things that we put out as a company. And I really think um, lightening the mood goes a long way during COVID. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is a slide from the Lego movie. And the reason that this is here is one of my favorite things that I miss the most about being in the office is anytime we would be having an incredibly rough day, um, my boss, Cam, the CTO, would walk into a meeting room and he'd say, everything is awesome. And I would just start laughing because it was not awesome. And he was clearly being funny. Um, and I thought, he, I thought he wrote that song for work. I did not know it was from the Lego movie. And so on the day I found out that it was from the Lego movie, like my whole world fell apart, but it became even funnier once I watched the video clip because I saw that it was like, everything is awesome when you're working with a team. And this was just such a fun way, I think. And I don't even know if Cam knew he was doing it and how much hap how, how happy it made me, but it was silly. It was funny, it was chill. And it was like, we talked about toxic positivity. 
he was not being toxically positive. He was being very sarcastic and saying, everything is not awesome. Everything is insane. And so I missed that from the office, but I think this is a good example of, of lightening the mood and kind of just saying like, okay, I'm, I'm validating that everything's crazy right now. I'm going to sing a little song from the Lego movie and we're still going to do this meeting. And so I think, you know, keeping the mood light when you can, um, posting funny things that you think are immediately relevant to the situation that you're in um, and not antagonistic or mean spirited, but like really, I, I think the best kind of humor right now that I found is just uh, like noticing the absurdity of the situation that we're in. Um, you know, like what is, is this really happening? Um, there's so many of that, those things that have been going on and, and just kind of keeping your, your humor light, not attacking anyone or anything, but just uh, being silly, being weird, I think really, really helps a lot. Um, another thing that has been happening at RS21 is um, we've been getting a lot of really nice care packages uh, from our executive leadership team. And so we've gotten cactuses, um, we've gotten RS21, wait, I'm doing it wrong, RS21 masks, which are super cool. Um, and we got a package of Rude Boy, Boy cookies. And these were all things that were unexpected. They just showed up at our door. Everyone across the United States, even if you you know lived in DC, you were still receiving uh, cookies or, or a cactus. And just having this come to us, it wasn't, it wasn't even the fact that it was a present. It was a fact that, that our team was, was leading, to, like just thinking of us. I'm gonna read the message that came with a cactus. I've killed my cactus which is unfortunate, but I keep this message on my desk. We hope this brings you a smile and some hope. In difficult times, always remember regrowth is possible. Believe in humanity, believe in each other and allow those beliefs to take seed and grow. We miss you, RS21. And I was just like, oh, this is one of my favorite days at work. Thank you for the cactus. And it, it just really helped, it helped lighten the mood. It really did evoke childlike wonder. And that, that a lot of those, this was a suggestion that came from our employee well-being group, right? And they said, hey, people would like care packages. There we go. Thank you, Employee Wellbeing Group. Thank you, C-Suite. Um, the other thing too is that if you don't have a big budget for this kind of stuff, if you don't, you know, you're not set up to do this, there's just goofy stuff you can do at work that can keep the mood light. Um, on the left of the screen here, you'll see a Slack conversation that we had where everybody was asked to post a picture of their um, workspace. And there was like people laughing, like I work out of a closet or here's my folding table. I hope you like it. And it was just funny to share this and, and kind of um, have some camaraderie around, wow, this is totally bizarre. And the cool thing about this is that it's not like some cultural director saying it is now time for the Thursday fun on Slack. This is random things that people would just post and encourage one another to participate in. The image in the center, um, I don't know if any of you got into the Bernie memes that were sweeping the nation a couple weeks ago, but Megan, our awesome marketing director, made this of uh, Bernie in front of our building. And it was just funny. It was just like, what the heck? And then the one that I've had the most fun with recently is I posted a Friday question and I said, what is that gross thing you used to eat when you were a kid that is like you had no business eating because it wasn't food, but it's still awesome and you would totally eat it now. And we just got the, got the weirdest things from like, you know, uh, Ghostbusters themed uh, juice boxes to that gross square pizza that everyone really loved in, in elementary school. And so there's just, you know, I'm a very goal oriented. I can be relatively serious. I can be very like, I need to go to the meeting. I need to write the notes down. I have an action item list. And, and this year has really helped me understand that wasted time is not always time wasted. And that's news to me. And I'm trying to give myself more permission to be involved with this stuff. I mean, still be responsible, still get my stuff done, but having these kinds of conversations, evoking childlike wonder, keeping the mood light has been really, really helpful. I think, and overall maintaining my connections with my team and just feeling like my life is okay. Sometimes work is the best thing that happens to me all week. And so I like to make sure that maybe it's the best thing that happens to somebody else too. So my questions for you about evoke childlike wonder would be, when was the last time you actually laughed at work? What's one thing that always cheers you up? Would it cheer up others too? And maybe what's one thing that you could do to lighten the mood for your team? Questions, comments? Nope, okay. And so the last thing, and I think this is the, this is the underpinning of everything we do. Hey Jess. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, hey, it's Deborah, just really quick. I. I really appreciate all of your um, ideas and your info. It's just fabulous. And um, you know what? I have this weird epiphany, like I woke up today, my 17 year old has been doing online schooling and then she has like this hour break. <laughs> and so 
some days I have to actually, um, lately she did great the fall semester, but now this semester I started getting absent notices because they really weren't doing that during the fall. And so and she's like, I fell back asleep. So I've been staying home, working from home and, you know, like, okay, okay. And they're driving her crazy, you know, until I pretty much get yelled at. But, um, but then you like have this epiphany. So like the duration of it all, and I know I'm just kind of throwing this in there. First of all, I wanted to know who your therapist was, but we can talk about that offline. And um, then um, I was just thinking like all of a sudden, like, yeah, I had this feeling of epiphany. And my daughter Gretchen was like, all of a sudden I'm having anxiety going outside because everything feels fake outside. And then she started getting me thinking about that. And I'm like, okay, we got to control our self-thought. We control, control our self-thought. Um, anyway, I just was thinking about that when, as you were talking about it, because, you know, like you said, it's, it's been all these tools and things we've been trying to do to stay sane. And all of a sudden, like just, and, and I think there's, you know, definitely a light at the end of the tunnel, but it just feels like it keeps going and going and going. And so then after she was saying everything's fake outside this morning, I was kind of like, all. Oh, I'm scared to go look outside, but I think I really need to go outside. I need to get in the car and I need to go someplace, but is everything fake, you know? Okay, so I just thought that I'd throw that in there for- Yeah, no, and I'll just- oh, You made me that. laugh. No, the, it, and I'm glad that made you laugh, but I will, I will validate that it's, it's like an ebb and flow. Like some days are fine and some days are like, what is my life? And just acknowledging that that's real, that you're feeling it. The hard thing is, is that on the day where you're like, everything's fine. This is, this is great. I love working from home. It's quiet. And I am focused is the day that somebody else on your team is like, I don't think the trees are real today. And, you know, it, it's just, you have to understand that everyone's working on this weird ebb and flow. So and other people are saying that about things not being real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not just my teenager. And she's sober, I swear. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's just this, I mean, and there's a lot of, I, I didn't get into this with like the COVID psychology, but there's a lot about trauma response, engaged trauma, uh, like sustained trauma response, how you uh, trick yourself into keeping going, even when things are insane. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, we come up with some creative solutions to how we exist in the world. And sometimes it can feel very detached and very bizarre. Um, and so I think that that's actually a pretty good segue into my last, my last bit here, um, loving humanity and patience and persistence. If I say one thing at work more than anything else, I say, you just need to be patient and persistent. I say that all the time. And I think this is really, I mean, we are going through, uh, like a Sisyphus like effort of pushing this damn COVID ball up the hill every single day. And sometimes we almost get it to the top. And some days by noon, the ball has smashed us and we're dead. And we're like, cool, just do it again tomorrow. And so I think being patient and persistent with your team, like understanding that you know, they're going to have good days. They're going to have bad days there. Some people are going to like change, you know, evolve and learn and disrupt all the time. Other people, it's like, man, I've been here for a year and I finally feel like speaking up, um, with, with the people that you work with, with your organization, right? Like I've, I put out a bunch of things today that some of you are probably doing. And some of you are probably like, I need to do those two, three, two, three things at my office, but guess what? You're not going to be able to go in the office tomorrow and be like, by the way, we need to buy everyone cookies and just have, I mean, maybe you will, that would be cool, but maybe these things are going to take time. And if you say it once, that may not be enough for it to happen. So don't give up on the things that you really care about um, and, and keep coming back to saying like, hey, we, we should do that thing. Can, can, we, can we do it this quarter? Can we do it next quarter? All right, cool. I'll, I'll keep bringing it up because I think it's cool. Um, be patient with other people, right? Like, I, I don't even think I need to say this, but you never know what someone's going through. You never know what they're experiencing. And so just being patient and persistent with people around you people are refusing to wear their masks at the grocery store. Like, no, I need you to wear your mask. Okay. I'm going to be patient. All right. Now I'm just going to leave. Um, those kind of things, but like most of all being patient and persistent with yourself, um, as leaders, as people who are in charge of things, sometimes I think it's easy to beat ourselves up and be like, I didn't do this thing. Right. Or that conversation went really poorly, but that's okay because we are also people and we are also getting through this. And so being patient and persistent with ourselves towards, you know, living our values, 
coming to work as the person we want to be changing the things that we know we really need to change. I think that's, that's the most important thing. And so finally, this is a, this is a quote I always talk about with my designers about um, you're responsible for what you put into the world and how it affects the world. It's around ethical design. Um, I, I really would say that as leaders and people who lead teams, a lot of what you put into the world is how you interface with and how you treat your team. If you, you know, are bringing your best self to work, if you're being humble, you know, if you're evolving and learning, just encouraging your people to disrupt by empowering your staff, you know, understanding that this is energetically a marathon, lightening the mood when you can, like, that's how you're going to see happy, healthy, high-performing teams. It's not through charting this KPI. It's not through having a conversation with somebody about how they could do better at the next presentation. It's about seeing your staff holistically, treating yourself with respect, treating your staff with trust and respect, and expecting the same from everybody that you work with. So that's all I had to say, and I got it done in one hour and one minute. Um, these are some resources I have included. Jill and I are constantly sending each other HBR articles about emotional intelligence and coronavirus. Mark Manson is um, not for everyone, but he gives really, really good advice. Um, uh, the best management book I've ever read is called A Lapsed Anarchist Book, A Lapsed Anarchist Guide to Being a Better Leader. Um, there's the uh, strengths-based culture, human in the workplace, what's funny and what's not, and we need to talk about crying at work articles that I think are really strong. Um, and these are some, some videos and talks uh, just to kind of check out. Um, the giving the right amount of shits talk, avoiding burnout. Marty, if you're on this call, I think I saw you earlier, you need a reprise of that because that's one of the best longest talks I've ever seen about avoiding burnout that's actually very practical. So some discussion points that I just kind of wanted to throw out here for the remainder of the time, if anybody's interested, is just like, do you have any questions for us or for the EWB? Um, what's working for you that we didn't cover here that other people might want to know about? Um, what are you experiencing in your environment that limits your ability from doing these kinds of things? And then to the rest of the group, how might you solve that problem or what suggestions do you have? And then are there any resources or books or, or talks or blogs that we should all be looking at and checking out? So I'm going to stop talking and hopefully everyone else will talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, you're super inspiring and obviously <laughs> super effective um, with time management. So yes, we would love to hear from um, anyone that wants to share um, any successes or tips they're doing or questions um, or resources. Hi, this is uh, Lisa Montoya. It, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was an eye opener. Um, it's great to see the perspective and and what your experience. Um, so uh, I just I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for putting this together. Um, what, one thing that I've been doing with my team, um, we call it, you know, because we were so used to having like a coffee break or going to office to office is doing like the virtual coffee break and, and checking in with them, asking them, yeah, you know, it, what's, what, what's working well, like you've mentioned, um, how can I help? Or, you know, we have a, who, you know, uh, but just kind of be there and they're not, it, they don't have to be very long meetings. I started scheduling them for like a, a half hour and uh, sometimes they would, you know, hit the half hour sometimes, but it's just more free talking and like listening, just really listening to what they're going through. But then also, uh, I think what's important is we, we allowed carryover of vacation because last year, a lot of people couldn't take off. So instead of using and losing, um, we actually implemented a carryover so they could have their vacation this year. So hopefully when things open up, they can take a vacation and have those hours from last year. Um, and I think that really uh, motivated the employees because we had a carryover program, but it wasn't, it was limited. It was so many hours. I, I think it was 40 hours or 24 hours. So we, that's a huge, uh, that, that was a huge thing for our employees. And, I, and they're, now they're planning their vacations and, um, you know, their extra time off where they can actually take off and go on a cruise or whatever they want to do and still have time for sick leave and take care of their families. Um, so, so I think that that was a motivational uh, thing for our employees. Thank you.
Sue Ann, I know you have your hand up and I kept throwing you on mute because we were getting some feedback, but I'm sure you have some great points to say if you wanted to jump in now. Am I, am I wonky? You sound fine now. <laughs> Okay. No, you know, one of the things that um, I found, and, and it's kind of that epiphany, I think, um, you know, Deb, you mentioned the, the long tunnel and there's a light at it, right? So, you know, that tunnel's been going on at a, uh, for a year, right? And so we kept thinking it was a three-month tunnel and now you're sitting here at a year. And I think the motivation for my staff um, has been very, very much directed at the work we do in the mission and the service and has been there. Um, but what I noticed come January, right, was there was no end, <laughs> right? And when you're dealing with IT people who now are working from home, they are on it, on it 24 seven. Um, and we've been going 24 seven for so long um, with the staff, with the urgency of our programs that I, pro you know, and it was also me, right? I, I was 24 seven always answering my text message. And you set that example as a leader, right? So when you say, reach out to me anytime, and it's two in the morning and you pick up that text and you're saying, okay, what you got? You know, you're setting almost an example that everybody else has to be there like that too. And uh, so this, this past January is like, that's it. We need a blackout day. And I don't care what you do, but if you answer your phone, if you do an email, if you get on any communications, we're, we're going to, we're going to have to have some money put in the kitty. But I found myself, you know, people were like, yeah, 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 right. Well, Sue Ann goes on her blackout day and my phone's just lighting up. This was just this Monday that, that I went out on mine. I was like, oh my God, they're testing me. But I'm looking at it, right? So, you know, I had to stop myself so that others wouldn't do the same thing, right? Because they have their blackout days coming. And, and I think that's a great point that you made, Jess, that it's also about how you set that example, what you're doing as a leader so that you can help others. And I think, you know, we all have to keep that in mind. And for IT, it does have to be a, some sort of calm out situation that they're not, they're not online, right? Because they're online for their kids, they're online for this, they're online for everything. And there, there needs to be a blackout uh, for most folks. And doing the same thing yourself is imperative to set that example. Totally agree. <laughs> and I, I think it's also like one point though, is that to that to the point that everyone's different is your boundaries can be different than your staff's boundaries. And so like, I don't really have a boundary about working at night because that's sometimes when I actually really like to work, but I do have, I do have a, a like if I am a, my biggest boundary is more like needing reasonable time to accomplish a task. So it is to the standard of quality that I feel comfortable putting out. And I'm pretty good about saying like, no, I need two days to do that. Please. And thank you. Hey, Jess, how do we like Suzanne, Sue Ann was talking about, um, I can actually do a blackout day if I know everybody else is out for Martin Luther King or for Christmas or for, um, you know, the certain holidays and, and then, so suggestions on preventing guilt when you take a blackout day and or Sue Ann and all of the rest of you. And it, I don't know, it's the middle child mother thing in me. I don't know, everything that's like, so I take a blackout day, but I'm like, oh man, everybody else is working. Everybody else is doing emails. And, so, I, and there's like that guilt component, which it's not getting me anywhere because I, you know, having taken off like, yeah, two or three days in the last year, you know, it's like. It's this weird motor where we're like, okay, now you can be plugged in instead of like leaving work and then coming home. I, I think that like um, one of the things that I do is if I am in a position where I feel like I can't take a day of PTO or a week or a blackout day or whatever, I start to look at the processes and systems I have in place because I feel like if I can't step away, I haven't empowered my staff to make decisions. I haven't mm -hmm. empowered work independently. Um, and, you know, everyone likes to be needed, but at the same point, like if I can't walk away for a day, like I'm doing something wrong and I need to rethink my systems and my processes and how this can be scalable and sustainable. So that's, that's a thought for me. 
Um, and I also, I read this article once where it's like, the work will never stop. When you die, the work will still be there. Like you will cease to exist and your pile of work will go to somebody else. And so this idea of like, I have to be all caught up to do the thing is, is just like, does not follow the laws of physics. And so you just have to say, I am stepping away because I want to, I'm not gonna feel guilty about this. And I will return a better, happier, healthier person and be more productive on Tuesday because I'm taking Monday off. I have a point to add to that too, Deb, because I know that when like, Jess, I loved your presentation, by the way. I was like, yes, yes. I'm like screenshotting it first. And I was like, oh, good. She's sending us the slides because I have to work. But I was, one thing I do, Deb, because I'm, I'm very, very big, especially as a single mom, of not letting work interfere with Kaya, with my daughter. So I have an eight-year-old and I'm like, she is going to know that she comes first before work. You know, it doesn't mean that I can never work. But what I do if I'm really trying to check out, first of all, she knows that like, I'll check the phone a few times a day just to forward things to my assistant. And she like knows that's why she knows it's like, she doesn't hear the ding on the phone and think anything because she knows I don't jump when I hear a ding on the phone at all. And when I'm like, we have scheduled this two hours mama daughter time every night where nothing gets touched. Like there is no technology. I'm never looking at my, but it's, you were saying Deb that like, you know, and I want to check out, but everyone else is doing emails and what do I do? You wouldn't actually know if anyone else is doing emails or anything if you don't turn on your devices. I really encourage all of you to turn off your technology, you know, at least on Sundays or something, like to make sure you're sort of giving yourself that time, especially now we're so interwoven with personal and work stuff. It's just like, give yourself at least like an afternoon or whatever it is to turn it off. It can help. I, I don't exactly know how this works, but I feel like Bresden has their hand up. Hi, and thank you. You totally nailed my name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to put like just a synonym on the word leadership and, you know, all of these amazing things that you went over, which I absolutely adored and I loved. Um, I'm a senior developer right now, actually getting a graduates in leadership because I actually really just really love the science behind it and just how much it helps my own life. But also being a role model in a team, not just a leader, um, and doing all of these steps as a team member has huge impact. Um, and so it's not just like I'm in a leader's leadership position. How do I, you know, affect my team and motivate my team and, you know, try to have this like amazing end result because my team's so happy, but also just from a team perspective, like when I was an associate developer, um, I would go out of my way, even though I was really stressed and had imposter syndrome really badly, um, but I would go out of my way to like sit down with another team member and try to talk to them and find out what was going on with them. And we ended up having like a very, you know, safe team space that did not have our leader involved at all. And everyone started picking up on that. So like, you can do these things, not just when you're in this position where you're responsible for these people. Like you are allowed to be empathetic as a human all the time. And I think COVID has been really hard because I've, I don't love humanity anymore. Like I'm having a really hard time remembering that I like people. <laughs> and uh, there's just so much you know, awful news and just the things going on and going outside. I, yes, it feels fake, but it's also just really, really scary. Maybe it feels safe, like fake because I don't trust it anymore. <laughs> um, of course it's fake, right? And so trying to, I loved your last slide about loving humanity because that's what I struggle with all of a sudden. When I am, I'm always there for people. I love, you know, volunteering my time like that's what gets me going and and lately it's been like no 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 <laughs> like I, I forgot I've forgotten and and it's sad and and I think that um, these values that you've been presenting are just they hit home I think for a lot of us and yes all the time but especially now because um, it this stuff is real and I really appreciate this talk right now and I'm glad that I was able to attend so thank you awesome thank you for coming 
Is anybody having like real problems with anything at work that we can like help troubleshoot right now? Or it's like, I'd really want to do this thing. And here are my blockers. Marty, I see your eyes are all big. What's your mouth? <laughs> One, thanks for the shout out for my burnout talk. And also I totally need to go watch my old bur burnout talk. <laughs> uh, the, this pandemic has been a little rough. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, there's tons of great stuff in here that I just think, oh man, I, there's a lot of this. I'm, I'm, you know, feel like I'm kind of on that line of, of barely coping versus like really, and, you know, um, you know, taking things on and, um, excelling in, in, in providing leadership or, you know, empathy or all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's just kind of figuring out where to jump in and, practice self-care, you know, do it bit by bit. All right. What, what are some little incremental steps I can take to be doing a better job of like supporting for my team? So um, this is, this is super helpful. I just saw your eyes go big and I was also happy to see you. So I had to <laughs> okay. Marty's in Michigan. <laughs> nice with RS21. No, no. She's like my sister-in-law. She had a baby with my brother, which, you know. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> well, no, she and she's also a director of UX. We went to grad school together and our careers have been like exactly the same the entire time. So she's a really good friend of mine. And she's going to write a book about burnout when she stops being burned out. Yeah, right. <laughs> we love you, Marty. I'm right. I, I, it's like such, it's so nice. I'm kind of like, oh good. I'm not the only one, but oh, I'm, but I'm fine. Um, so anyways, it looks like we have, I, I'm sure Renee is going to jump in, but um, yes. Carolyn? My dog, my dog, my dog was just jumping in, saying it's dinner time. But for this has been fantastic. Um, for those who oh. you know, want to talk, like let's let's talk and you know, stay on, or you know put in the chat. For those that need to go, certainly we really appreciate you guys joining us. Yeah, we have a few more hands if um, if Jess can stay on or if. Yeah, I I I I'm totally here for you guys. So I'm Caroline, here. I think you had your hand up. Uh, thank you for calling on me and thank you for the talk and um, thanks for presenting it to all of us. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to say that touch back on uh, psychological safety and I think that there's events around psychological safety that have made it a much bigger um, port in the storm than um, perhaps it had been in the past. Um, psychological safety now includes like, am I going to be healthy in this environment? Um, is it gonna support my need to stay away from COVID to the extent that I need it to? Um, am I protecting my grandmother? Um, psychological safety is, am I gonna be fed? Is it, I'm gonna, am I gonna lose my house? Um, anywhere that provides it is going to be a port in the storm for anybody seeking it. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot bigger deal um, in these last year and a half than it used to be. That's all I wanted to share, thank you. It's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. I never thought of it. Now I'm all stressed. I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> it's actually more responsibility than I thought, but it's a good point. And Rebecca has her hand up. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk because, you know, I came from a company that did not have a lot of psychological safety. Um, and now I've been at Twistle, which is an IT healthcare company for about a month now. And it's really eye opening to kind of compare and contrast you know, the environment you were in, which was very toxic versus the environment that you are in now, which is very healthy. And a lot of the things that you were bringing up, they practice. And it was really cool to see that in their team meeting. And they were all things that I asked of my last company, you know, can we have this? Can we exercise this? How can I achieve this? And I got into a mode where it became, you know, that is almost my fault for asking for those things? Am I asking for too much? Is that something that I'm not afforded because I'm here to work? So it's really cool, you know, to come into a situation where that is normal, that's accepted. And it's incredibly life-changing for my personal health because now I'm going, oh, I can spend a t like an hour journaling. Maybe I had the same amount of time, but my time and my personal health was getting consumed by that stress from my work environment. So I really enjoyed your talk because I think that it's, it runs over into so much more than just your work environment. I think it, it affects you throughout your entire day <laughs> into your sleep. I know it does for me. So thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're more, you're more than welcome. Like I, I think we're, oops, you get muted. That's okay. Um, 
Am I muted? Am I unmuted now? Um, I, we, when we started off doing this, I think the thought at RS21 with the values and with the employee well-being group was how can we make RS21 a better place to be? How can we make it better for everyone that's here? An unintended consequence, I think, is it's really become great for recruiting because we can say like, hi, like we actually care about you and here's the benefits and we just all got you know, stock options and we have an employee well-being group and, you know, and we're not perfect, right? Like, I'm not saying it's some sort of like magical Shangri-La where like the human factor stops existing. There's still people, we still are cranky, things still go wrong, but like we, I don't think we really understood how much we're getting people, like I, I put out an internship the other day and we had 107 applicants within a week for a design internship. And yes, that is part of sadly some of the times that we're going through, but the other part is like, people are starting to think, where do I want to work where I'm doing work that I like with people that I can stand and, and even possibly like, and that's important. And I'm glad, I'm really glad that you're able to find a place that you're starting to feel. Oh, it's incredible. It's an incredible blessing because I feel like a lot of people are just struggling to find work. So it's great to be able to achieve that. Anybody have questions for Jill about the employee well-being group or, you know, anything? Because I, th I think that that is like, whoa, that blew my mind when we started doing that. I, Jill, no, I think it's fantastic. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm a recruiter, so I talk to companies all the time about, you know, exactly what you're talking about, wellness and attracting talent and retaining them. And not a lot of companies have a formal um, process when it comes to employee wellness. So, you know, my question would be is, you know, how would you advise, um, you know, staff or management or people within a company to introduce that idea to their organization? Well, that's a big one. Um, I think, it, first of all, you have to have the relationships, you have to know your audience, you have to know your leadership and whether or not it's going to go over well. I, I don't think employee well-being um, in the respect that we're doing it at RS21 is going to be for everyone. Um, sorry, my dogs have decided to say hi. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's, you know, it's challenging. Um, it can be a lot of work and um, it, it, it also like comes with great power, you know? There's, there's a lot to be said for giving a little bit of that power back to your staff and back to the employees in an organization. It's so, something like, uh, Jess calls it agency, I call it the IKEA effect. Um, it's when, you know, employees are working to build something of their own they feel they are now a part of it rather than just being, you know, on the sidelines doing the work and not getting any of um, any of the accolades or reaping any of the rewards. So I think you first have to understand your audience. You have to know your leadership and what will work for them and what won't. Um, I think I felt safe enough to do it because I was empowered by Jess, you know, what she was saying earlier about um, empowered people, empower people is very true. I never could have done this had I not had the space created for me to do it. So I would say, seek out that space and find that person at your company or persons at your company who want to go in on this with you. Um, it's a lot easier to disrupt and be real when you have um, a, a horde of people working alongside you to do it. I hope that answers your question. It was kind of a roundabout way. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's great. And I mean, I, you know, I work for a very large, you know, organization with a strong executive team and infrastructure in place, right? So those kind of things happen. But I talk to a lot of companies and especially small mid-sized companies where, you know, there isn't something formal in place. And so, you know, it seems like there would be an opportunity to kind of almost have a grassroots effort where, you know, you're, you're, you, you know, collaborating on employee wellness, taking care of each other, right? Kind of like Bresden said, and maybe you can influence, you know, the, the culture where that becomes maybe a little bit more of a formal strategy. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, one of the things we talked today about in our planning session is um, the art of listening. Um, and I think we provide a platform for that. Not everyone is going to be 
to feel completely safe going to their director or their boss or HR. Um, and so we, we provide this like, this gap, like we fill a gap, we, we provide a space for people to do that um, and just listen. It's, it's almost like talk therapy on some days, yeah. you know, like we can just sit there and listen to each other. And then just by listening, you're able to pull out those themes and say, okay, well, what I hear is that a lot of people in X group are having Y problem. Um, and then you can start to kind of ideate on ways to fix things. That's awesome. Thanks, Jill. It looks like Athena has her hand up. Yeah, hi. It's so good to see everybody. And, and I you know, apologize, I missed a, a lot of the talk. But <clears throat> from listening to um, what everybody's saying now, it's almost as if uh, we're trying to make work and the workplace take the place of our maybe our families and our community and um, neighborhoods. I mean, I remember when I could walk outside and just walk over to the neighbor and um, knock on their door. Um, hopefully we'll be going back to this or even my uh, faith community. I know like my church, that's my carve out is Sunday morning worship. And I was very thankful that they also set up um, a buddy system in which two, it was just two people looking out for each other and and kind of setting up something within the framework of, of that community, which might be something, you know, much more easily done within a workspace as well. I know my son has started a new job. He's only been at it one, one month and, and I think he's been into work to actually meet people maybe five days out of that month. So, you know, then you're talking about trying to have relationships with people you you know, you've met over Zoom. <laughs> so just throwing that out. I don't have a job that pays. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. And I think, you know, we're, one of the things that we're doing uh, when I hear you say that, you know, work is replacing the community and, and like the faith groups, I kind of like, no, like I still want my life. But the reality is we spend so much time at work. Um, you know, those relationships are important. And one of the things the employee well-being group started, um, and this is, this is a pretty cool story too. Um, the employee well-being group said, hey, our staff needs more time to just socialize with one another because we don't have those run-ins in the kitchen or in the hallway anymore. And we're, we are, you know, hiring so many people who have never met anybody because we're in a big period of growth at RS21. And so the employee well-being group said, hey, can we, can we do coffee breaks well, on company time, like charged to our admin code? Can we do coffee breaks where we just set up through this little app on our Slack channel, a chance for people to have a half hour conversation and just talk about not work. And the first time the employee well-being group asked, um, C-suite was like, no, no way. We're not gonna waste all that money on people just screwing around. Are you kidding me? And then we really got into like the thick of the pandemic after summer, I think it was around fall, being patient and persistent, the employee well-being group went back this time with the diversity, equity, inclusion group and the values working group and said, we three groups want coffee breaks. Do you think we should have coffee breaks? And, and our leadership team was like, oh yeah, we should do that. Totally. <laughs> and I've gotten so much positive feedback from people who have participated in it. And, and it's not, again, wasted time is not time wasted. I was going to drop your patience and persistence there, but you beat me to it. I also wanted to give a shout out to Erin because um, she was a big part of that conversation. She was the values working group lead for a while, and we had been having those conversations over and over. And I, I can't remember who said it earlier, but someone else mentioned the coffee break or the water cooler idea. Um, uh, Lupe, I think it may have been you. And um, it's been huge. It's gone over really, really well to kind of replace that like hallway chatter. It's been awesome. Well, I, that's all I have. So um, feel free to, you know, reach out to me. My email is super easy. It's jess at rs21.io. Um, I'm going to be sending, I need a, do you guys want the, just the slides or do you want the slides with all like my random chicken scratch